we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Peace is necessary in order to grow, to flower, to understand, to have time to look around, to explore into ourselves and what we find there. We must have peace. Hello and welcome to episode 90 of Urgency of Change. Each weekly episode in this season of the Krishnamurti podcast is based on a major theme of the philosopher's talks, such as freedom, self-knowledge, beauty, intelligence and meditation. Extracts from our archives have been carefully selected to represent Krishnamurti's different approaches to each of these universal and timelessly relevant themes. This week's theme is peace. Upcoming themes are ambition, fear and conflict. This podcast is brought to you by Krishnamurti Foundation Trust based at Brockwood Park in the UK. For more information about activities and programmes at Brockwood, such as the Krishnamurti Retreat Centre, Brockwood Park School and more about the Foundation, please visit our website at kfoundation.org. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. This week's episode on peace has three sections. The first extract is from Krishnamurti's first talk in Sanan, 1983, titled Is it possible to live in peace? In a world that has no peace whatsoever, there is such chaos, disorder, great danger, terrorism, threats of war. These are all facts. And in this world, living every day of our lives, with all the turmoil, with all the labour that man has to do, with all the problems we have to face, is it at all possible to live in peace? Because in the world there is no peace. The politicians talk about it. The hierarchy of the Catholic Church talk about it. So do the Hindus and the Buddhists and all the Muslims and so on. But actually there is no peace. And peace is necessary in order to grow, to flower, to understand, to have time to look around, to explore into ourselves, and what we can find there. We must have peace, not peace from freedom from something, freedom between two walls, between two rows, between two problems, or a sense of physical relaxation, that's not peace. Peace is something much more fundamental, much more deep than the superficial freedom that one has or one thinks one has. So we're going together this morning, part of the morning, to talk over together as two friends whether it is possible to live in peace, both inwardly, 
psychologically and outwardly. We may want peace and we may see the necessity of having peace, but we do not live a peaceful life. And the world is preparing, preparing, preparing for war. Ideologies fighting each other. Not, they are not consider consider human beings, but only the extension of power, and so. On. So we cannot possibly look for peace from the politicians and governments. That's a fact. They have talked about Parsham Terrace, peace on earth, and there has never been peace on earth. On the contrary, Religions have helped to bring about wars. You know all about it, so I won't go into it. They have tortured, condemned, excommunicated, burnt, and then next moment talk about peace. Probably the Buddhists and the Hindus are the only ancient Buddhists and Hindus in their religion they have accepted the dictum, don't kill, but they do kill. That's just an idea again. And the Islamic world is full of what they are, you know all about it. Those religions that are formed, established on books, become bigotry, fundamentalists, and they become terror also of the world. And institutions and foundations, groups have promised peace. But they too do not give peace. So where does one find peace? Because one must seek very clearly, without peace we are like animals. We are destroying each other. We are destroying the earth, the ocean, the air. And <coughs> politically and religiously we have looked to t leaders to unify and bring about peace in the world, but they have not succeeded either. Governments, politicians, religious people, those peop groups that are searching for peace, they, none of them have given human beings, you and me, the speaker, peace. So where do we find it? Without that, fundamental necessity. We cannot possibly understand greater things of life. So together we are going to go into this. Not verbally, not intellectually, But find out for ourselves as human beings, without any guide, without any leadership, because they've all failed, without any priest, without any psychologist, can we have peace in the world? in the world and in us. First, can we have peace in ourselves? 
The word peace is rather a complicated word. One can give different meanings to it, depending upon our moods, depending on our intellectual concepts, <coughs> romantically, emotionally, we can give different meanings to it. But can we together, not different, give different meanings, but comprehend the word and the significance and the depth of that word. It's not merely the freedom from something, peace of mind, physical peace, but the ending of all conflict. That's real peace. Not only in ourselves, but with our neighbours and with the world. Peace with the environment, the ecology, and all that, to have deep-rooted peace, unshakable, And not superficial, not a passing thing, but timeless depth of peace. When I sought peace through meditation all over the world, that has been one of the purposes of meditation. But meditation is not it's the search for peace. Meditation is something far different, which we'll go into presently. So what is peace? And how can we establish and lay the foundation so that we build on that, psychologically speak. You understand, sirs? We are talking over together. I am not pointing out, the speaker is not the authority, But in talking over together, things become very clear. If we can talk over together without any bias, without any prejudice, having no conclusions or concepts what peace is, then we can go into it together. But if you have opinions about peace, what peace should be, then your inquiry stops. Opinions have no value, though the whole world is run on opinions. Opinions are limited. Your opinion or the speaker's opinion, <coughs> opinions of the totalitarian governments, or the opinions of the church people and, and so on, <coughs> they're all limited. Your, judge, your judgment and the opinion of which, val which gives values are all limited. I hope we understand the word, what it means to be limited. When you think about yourself from morning till night, as most people do, it's very, very limited. 
when you say you are space, it's very limited. <coughs> or when you are proud to be a British, as though you are God's chosen people, that too is limited. So, <coughs> opinions are limited. And when one sees that clearly, then one does not cling to opinions or the values that opinions have created. But then your opinion against another opinion doesn't bring about peace. That's what is happening in the world. One ideology against another ideology, the communist, socialist, the democrat and so on. So please understand, if I may repeat again, that we are talking over together and if you are adhering to your opinion, and I am sticking to mine, then we shall never meet. So there must be freedom from opinions and its values. Is that clear? <coughs> Can we go on from there? That you are actually not holding back your opinions and use and use them as access to beat each other, to kill each other. But opinions are have are limited and therefore they must inevitably bring about conflict. If you hold on to your conclusions and your conclusions are also limited, another <coughs> holds his conclusions, his experience, which are always limited, then there must be not only conflict, wars, destruction and all the rest of it. If you see that very clearly, then opinions become very, very superficial and have no meaning. So please, when you are inquiring into what is peace and whether we can live in peace, don't have opinions about it. Be free to inquire and in that inquiry act. The very inquiry is action, not that you inquire first and then act, but in the process of inquiry you are acting. I hope again this is clear, that there must be freedom, which is the very basis of peace. There must be freedom from all the values of opinions, so that we can together actually, not theoretically, but factually, that you and the speaker have no opinions, which is a tremendous demand, because we live on opinions. All the newspapers, magazines, books are based on opinions. Somebody says that you agree and that's your opinion too. Another reads another book and forms an opinion. So please, to find out the true meaning of peace and the depth of it and the beauty of it and the quality of it, there must be no bias. Obviously, that's the first demand.
Not that you must have faith in peace or make your life, the goal of your life to live peacefully or search out from books, from others, what is peace, but to inquire very deeply whether your whole being can live in peace. Action is not separate from perception. When you see something to be true, that very perception is action. Not that you perceive or understand and then act. That's an intellectual concept and you put that concept into action. The seeing is the action. The seeing that the world is broken up into tribalism, the British, the German, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Swiss, there are tribes. To see that fact that there are tribes glorified as nations and this tribalism is creating havoc in the world. bringing wars in the world. Each tribe has thinks its own culture opposed to other cultures. But tribalism is the root, not the culture. <coughs> so in observing that, the fact of that, is the action which frees the brain from the condition of tribalism. Is it clear? <coughs> Are we making this clear between ourselves? <coughs> that when you see actually, not theoretically, or as ideationally, but as a fact, that tribalism, which has had certain benefits in it, but <coughs> the very fact that it exists as glorified nation is one of the causes of war. That's a fact. There are the causes of war. economics, and so on. We won't. One of the causes is tribalism. When you see that, perceive that, and that cannot bring about peace, the very perception frees the brain from its condition of tribalism. Is it? Mr. Mon, oh. we are together in this. We are talking over together. <coughs> I'm, the speaker is not persuading you. He's not trying to convince you of anything. He's not doing propaganda of any kind. But we are facing things as they are. Oh. Head on. And one of the factors of contention throughout the world is religion. You are a Catholic, I am an Arab, Muslim, and so on. Based on ideas, propaganda of two thousand years, and the Hindus and the Buddhists, over three to five thousand years, we have been programmed like a computer. 
Please see the fact that programming has brought about great pic- architects, architecture, great pictures, great charms, music. But it has not brought about peace to mankind. When you see the fact of that, you do not belong to any religion. You are neither a Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, nothing. No. When you see that the division takes place when there are half a dozen gurus in the same place, you know what they are doing, don't you? They bring about misery, Contradiction, conflict. Your guru is better than mine. My group is more sanctified than yours. I have been initiated, you have not. You know, all that nonsense that goes on. So when you see all this as an actual fact, which is so round you, when you do not belong to any group, to any guru, to any religion, to any political commitment of ideas, this is very serious. If you really want to, and the urgency to live peacefully, there must be freedom from all this, because they are the causes of dissension, division. Truth is not yours or mine. It doesn't belong to any church, to any group, to any religion. brain must be free to discover it. And peace can only exist when there is freedom from this fallacy. Are we together so far? Even intellectually? You know, for most of us, <coughs> to be so drastic about things is very difficult, because we have taken security in things of illusion, in, in things that are not facts. <coughs> And it's very difficult to let them go. It's not a matter of exercising will or taking a decision. I will not belong to anything. That's that's another fallacy. We are to commit ourselves to something, to a group, to an idea, to a religious quackism, because we think there is some kind of security for us. And they, in all these things there is no security and therefore there is no peace. <coughs> the brain must be secure, and the brain with its thought <coughs> has sought security in things that are illusory. Right? So, freedom from that. Can you do it? Are you serious enough to want or crave to demand that one must live in peace?
The second extract is from the second question and answer meeting at Brockwood in 1984, titled Peace Requires Intelligence. We we'll talk over together. What is peace? And its relationship to intelligence. In a world that is disintegrating with wars and nationalism and sectarianism, idealisms and every form of division, opinion against opinion, data against data, judgment against judgment, and so on. Can we have peace in the world first? Or can we have, can we live peacefully? <coughs> what does it mean to live together, man, woman, and so on, or a group of people not committed to any belief or sect or uh, faith and so on, can we live together peacefully? Apparently this is one of the most difficult things in the world. Here too, there's a great deal of disturbance going on in England, strike after strike, and all the travails of human beings. And in search for peace, one goes off to a monastery, shaving one's head, putting on some kind of garb, and taking vows. This has been tried for generation upon generations, both in India and in the West and the Far East. A group of people committed to live peacefully and to subjugate all their opinions, conforming to a certain pattern of idealism, certain dogmas, a way of monastic life, and so on. When I heard the other day rather extraordinary fact, thing, there was a man who was very good at writing, literary. He was doing quite well. Je newspapers, magazines and all the rest of it. And he gave up all, one, all that one day and went off to some kind of retreat, an ashrama, a, a, a guru collects around himself. And there, what do you think he's doing? Pulling old nails out of old wood. And he's perfectly happy. You understand all this? And he is living peacefully, he says. Is that peace? To completely forget the world, what is happening in the world, forget any kind of responsibility, put aside any kind of relationship with another and take and disappear into a commune, into a community, or enter into a monastery, which is highly organized with the abbot whom we must obey 
utterly and so on. How does one find peace in the world and in oneself? I'm sure one has asked this question of oneself. To live completely peacefully in relationship to others, not isolate oneself. That's fairly simple and also it has its own dangers. The dangers are that you become more and more <coughs> self-centred or commit yourself to some symbol, a figure, or to some doctrinaire concept, and devote all one's energy to that, keeping that to oneself and working in a garden or in a vineyard, champagne and the good wines of France were produced by the monks. <laughs> and the monks have also fought, killed people. This has been going on for centuries. And one is living in a world that's really monstrously destructive, divisive, every form of brutality and so on. Where does one find peace? Can a group of people live together peacefully. Whether they are teachers, educators, or man, woman and so on. Does one look for peace or does one bring about peace? You understand me? Does peace lie externally, outside, the skin as it were, or does one really want peace? If one sets aside all the things that desire, will, thought, has conceived what is peace, wanting peace, and committed to some form of regulation, whether it is so-called spiritual or otherwise. Lots of people have disappeared in the army, because they have no responsibility there, governments look after you like in a monastery, but you walk, march, ready to kill and so on. So can one bring about peace within oneself? And is it possible, living in this world, knowing what the world is becoming more and more, both scientifically and so-called nationally, can one live or bring, create peace? To live in peace implies no act of divisiveness, right? no act of separation. No sense of me first and you second, both in a queue <laughs> and 
at home? Is that possible at all? Not only for oneself, but living with a group of people. The speaker has been from the for many, many years, sixty or more years. The speaker has been living with over sixty years with a group of people in India, America, here, all over the world, part of the world rather. And there there is always contention, always dissension, opinion against opinion. Why shouldn't I think this way? You think your way and so on. This process has been going on, not only now, oh, always, perhaps. And one wonders if it is at all possible to create peace. I'm using, one is using the word create in the ordinary sense of the word. Not creation. That's another matter. Can one, in a group of people, create peace in your house? Perhaps four of you, or two of you, if in a family. Can we? bring peace about? Or is that impossible? You understand my question? Does one really want to live in peace? And if one does, what price do you pay for it? Not in coins, not in banknotes and so on, but what, what are you willing or desirous or saying as, a, as we must live in peace and it's only in peace that one can really flower? What will you do? What will you put aside? What gesture will you make? You understand? It's very easy to superficially say, Yes, I'm willing to live in peace. I'll join your beastly little community or your commune, or I'll follow a guru, I'll come and live in that community. That's very easy and rather slack. Forgive that word. Rather indifferent to what is happening to the rest of the world. It's a form of exclusiveness. Not one is against the elite, but the exclusive way of looking at life. You know? Now are we willing to give up, put aside our own particular opinions? Particular judgments? Not that one must not have objections, discussions, stating what one thinks, and if one sees what one thinks is not correct, heal, change. Is all that possible? Or we are all so so obstinate, 
You understand my question? That we never, under any circumstances, yield unless we are forced. So we come to a point, if one wants really peace in oneself and in one's family or in one's group of people, to be highly sensitive, not only to your own, to one's own particular desires, that's fairly simple, to one's own uh, self-centred images, but to be sensitive to nature, to other people's ideas, other people's way of looking, their difficulties, their, if the whole process of living together, which requ- requires an enormous sense of yielding and watching and observing and highly, not interpretive, but seeing what the other is. He may be brutal, he may be insensitive, but help him to be sensitive, help him not to be normal. You follow? It's a constant sense of movement, not taking a stand at any time. Is that all? Possible. Not only in a family or in a group of people, like in a school, and we are very close to a school here. We are having a lot of trouble there too. So, this is a great problem, which not only we who are responsible here at the school at Brockwood, but also responsible to ourselves and to our environment, to the way we live. Because peace requires a great deal of intelligence. Not just say, I must live peacefully, I must leave the place where there is conflict and go somewhere else hoping to find where there is, in, where there is no conflict. In such place doesn't exist unless one becomes completely dull, completely insensitive, and doesn't care a damn what is happening. Sorry, you don't mind? And so on. So one has to inquire also what is intelligence? Because peace requires a tremendous intelligence. Isn't the thing you buy in the market? or in books, or re- repeating some chants, or some words, or pray for peace, good God. Humanity has prayed for peace from the beginning of days. And there has been no peace in the world or in oneself. And to have that quality of peace, which is unshakable, which has no shadow of disturbance in it, requires great intelligence. So we must ask ourselves, what is that intelligence? Is that intelligence born of books? Is that intelligence the outcome 
of complicated, subtle thought? Or is it a projection of an ideal and conforming to that pattern? Thought, with its limitation, has certain quality of intelligence. Otherwise, we couldn't be sitting here. You need intelligence to travel, to go to the moon. To go to the moon, there must have been thousands of people cooperating together to produce that rocket that went up there. That's a form of intelligence. And a scientist, a surgeon, to operate requires great skill, requires great some form of intelligence. So is all that born of knowledge, born of experience, accumulated skills with their high discipline, all the result and the product, the movement of thought, and thought being limited, as we talked about it the other days, can thought bring about peace, which has its own limited intelligence? Right? Or is intelligence nothing whatsoever to do with the activity of thought? You are following on this? Not only verbally, but see the logic of it, the reason for it. Thought, with its limitation, has created the most extraordinary things in the modern world. The rapid com- communication. <coughs> you do not know, one does not know if you have been on a battleship or a submarine. <coughs> the complications of it, the extraordinary energy that has gone to build those things. And the dynamo, motors and so on, immense energy, great deal of thought, knowledge has gone into all this. And therefore there is that quality of limited intelligence, because based essentially on thought or knowledge, and is there an intelligence which is not limited. One must ask these questions if one wants peace. One must ask these essential questions. Not only peace, a way of living, with great depth, great beauty, and it is only that quality of intelligence that can bring this about. That is, can there be peace without love? You don't see my question. Can there be peace without sense of compassion? Can can there be compassion if I if one belongs to a certain sect, religion, group, and so on? You understand my ask? 
If I'm attached to my particular conditioning as a Hindu, Muslim, Christian or Buddhist, I can read books that talk about compassion as being essential. There's no end to making of books, right? Are we all together or am I talking? So where do I find this? Where does one find this intelligence? Or come upon it? You cannot, one cannot possibly cultivate that intelligence. You can cultivate the limited intelligence in the world of science, biology, mathematics, art and so on. That can be cultivated carefully, day after day till you have that extraordinary skill. But is compassion, with its extraordinary intelligence, is that cultivable? Then, as it is not, you cannot cultivate day by day love, right? So what will you do if you want to live peacefully, deeply, without a single shadow of conflict between each other? What shall we do or not do? One has to go really very deeply into the question of desire, will and love. The final extract this week is from Krishnamurti's ninth talk in Sanin, 1964, titled Peace of Mind. What do you do when you have an immense problem? What do you do when something tremendously in the immediate happens? Now, either the incident the happening, the experience, is so tremendous, so vital, so demanding, that, you com- that it completely absorbs you. So your mind is taken over by that tremendous thing. And so the mind becomes quiet, because that thing is so potent, so vital, so dynamic, that your mind gives in and it is taken over. That's one form of silence. Isn't it? Like a child with a very interesting toy. The toy has become so extraordinarily interesting that he is no longer mischievous, he is no longer running about. The toy has become important. The toy has absorbed him. The toy makes him, forces him to concentrate. And so, with the grown-ups too, it is the same thing. When confronted with a great issue, 
the mind not comprehending the whole significance of it, gives itself over to that and becomes numb, shocked, paralyzed. And in that moment it is fleetingly silent, which most of us have experienced. Then there is the silence of the mind when the problem becomes, when the problem is looked at with complete concentration. When there is no distraction but complete concentration, when the mind is, has no other thought, no other interest, no, doesn't look anywhere but completely watching that thing. And an intensification of attention, of concentration, to the exclusion of everything else. In that concentration there is effort, there is the vitality, the, the demand, the urgency. And that also produces a certain quality of sight. Now there is a third which is not which has nothing whatsoever to do with the two silences which most of us experience at, at odd moments. The mind is not absorbed by the toy, by the problem. As that merely then is an escape. Like the word God, the images, the symbols which take over the mind. That is a, a deep escape, a flight from the actual. And in that flight there is a certain quality of silence, which is the product of a mind that demands to sacrifice itself, to forget itself in order to identify itself with something. When there is complete identification as the neurotic identifies himself with a belief, then he is perfectly quiet. But he is a neurotic state. This demand to identify oneself with the country, with an idea, with a symbol, with a race, with a purpose, with all that is a neurotic state, which most pe religious people are in, all religious people, because they have identified with themselves, with, with the Saviour, with the Master, with this and with that. So that gives them a tremendous release. And this release brings them a certain beatific attitude towards life, which is a, a totally neurotic attitude. Then there is the mind that has learned to concentrate. never to look beyond that which is in front. What is in front is the idea, is the image, is the symbol, a projected, conditioned response, and on that it concentrates. Now what takes place in that concentration? All 
concentration is effort. And all effort is resistance. Like building a defensive wall round yourself so that you can look through a little hole at that thing. a fortress, so that you are never attacked, you are never uncertain, never open, but always living within this sense of concentration, a sense of devoted, inspired pursuit of something. That, in that there is extraordinary sense of vitality, drive, and all you can do, extraordinary work, go, go to the slums, walk in the desert, live with people, but it is still born from the self-centred activity of a mind that concentrates and to the exclusion of everything else. And that also gives to the mind a certain quality of peace, a quality of silence. Now what we are talking about, a silence, has nothing whatsoever to do with these neurotic states. <coughs> and that's where our difficulty lies, because unfortunately most of us are neurotic. I am saying this with most politely. But to understand what we are talking about, which is neither concentration, which is neither being absorbed by the state, by the God, by a symbol, by your Saviour or your Master, or a belief or an idea. One must be completely be free of this neurotic state. Because in this there is no self-pity, There is no pursuit, there is no projection, there are no visions, and there is no concentration. When you have understood the absorption, the concentration, and also when you have understood the whole process of thinking and the self-centred activity, in observing, in looking, in watching, out of that comes an extraordinary sense of pliable discipline. And that discipline you must have, which is not a defensive, reactionary discipline, in that discipline there is no imitation, conformity, effort, but you must have that discipline, because that very observation of all the movement of thought, the desire, the demand for experiences, the self-identifying process with something, merely to observe it, to understand it, demands naturally an ease of discipline in freedom. So with that discipline, not sitting cross-legged or lying and all this stupid childish stuff, out of that discipline of understanding, 
Perhaps it's not that word itself, because for most of us discipline means conformity, like a soldier disciplining himself for the rest of twenty years, his mind is finished. Out of this understanding comes that peculiar quality of immediate awareness and perception. And out of this attention, and in this attention there is virtue, that is the only virtue. The social morality, the character that is developed as a resistance against or with society, with all its moralities and ethics, is not virtue at all. What is virtue is the understanding of this whole structure of man which man has built around himself. And understanding this self-sacrificing identification and control, out of that comes attention, and it, in that attention only there is virtue, and every other form of virtue is not virtue. So that you must have a virtuous mind, not a mind that is has conformed to the pattern of society. The communist or the capitalist or the social or the religious. Because without virtue, There is no freedom, the virtue of which we are speaking about. That virtue is not cultivated. Like humility, it cannot be cultivated any more than you can cultivate that thing that we call love. But when there is this attention, there is virtue and there is love. And out of this attention comes total silence, not only at the superficial level of the conscious mind, but also at the level of the unconscious. Both the conscious and the unconscious are really quite trivial, and the perception of that triviality makes the mind free from the past and from the present and therefore it is capable of giving its whole attention to the present. And out of this attention there comes silence. And it is the silence in which the mind is no longer experiencing, because there is nothing more to experience. All experiences has come to an end, because it is still completely, totally awake and, and is a light to itself. And out of this silence, and because it is silence, it is peaceful, not the politician's peace, nor the peace between two walls. And that peace is not a reaction. And when the mind is completely quiet, still, then it can proceed. The movement of stillness is entirely different from the movement of activity, of self-centred being. That movement is creation, 
And when the mind can live with that, then it knows death and love, and it can then live in a state, living in this world and yet be free of the world.